We're still in preseason mode. National Federation of High School has produced their annual points of emphasis. That's what we're covering today. National Federation of High School basketball points of emphasis for 2018. Stick around. Hey everybody, it's Greg Austin with a betterofficial.com where we craft video to help basketball officials get better and to take control of their officiating career. If you haven't already done so, you're new here, hit subscribe below. Also the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any of our new content, which during the basketball season will be two times a week. Before we get started, a special thanks to Mike Wong for this cup of coffee. Much appreciated, Mike. If you want to chip in, buy us a cup of coffee, there's a link above, right up here. You can follow that link to a betterofficial.com slash coffee. Buy us a coffee. Keep us caffeinated. Keep us producing content for you so we can all get better together. All right, today we're covering points of emphasis for 2018. Let's get started. Today we're covering NFHS new rules and points of emphasis for the 2018-19 basketball season. When new points of emphasis are released, we need to embrace what the NFHS is trying to accomplish, understand that, incorporate what's appropriate into our game, and improve our officiating along the way. When we're looking at points of emphasis from the National Federation of High School, it's important to remember these points of emphasis are communication to all the stakeholders in the game. School administrators, athletic department administrators, coaches, players, officials, officials associations, etc. Okay, it's for all stakeholders. Some of them are focused on non-officials. This year, there's a focus on concussion recognition and risk minimization. Okay, this is focused on coaches and ADs in handling properly the safety of their players. It's not a reflection on us, okay? We have a responsibility to alert coaches when we feel it's possible that a player has suffered an injury that is a possible concussion. Hitting their head hard on the floor, hitting their head on another player's knee or elbow, etc. Okay? We need to alert the coaches so that their training can come into play. If we see any exhibition of concussion-like symptoms from any players on the court, again, we need to alert coaches. If we have concussion-like symptoms, we are going to direct the player to leave the game, and we need those coaches to properly handle the players. That's a point of emphasis for coaches and administrators, proper handling of their players with possible concussions. Skin infections and communicable diseases, obviously this belongs in the purview of administrators, athletic directors, coaches, the way their players handle their hygiene, etc. Again, it's not a factor for us officials, all right? All right, there's a point of emphasis this year on the responsibility for proper uniform and apparel. I would say it's proper uniform and equipment, as it's defined by rules. This is directed not at us as basketball officials. We already know the rules. We're already handling them. This is an emphasis to shift responsibility for understanding proper uniform and equipment rules onto the coach and have them embrace their role in the process. Let's be clear. The existing rule code adequately addresses the requirements, but must be understood by coaches and players and properly applied by contest officials. Okay, so we need to do our job consistently, but coaches and players are responsible now for understanding those rules and restrictions on their uniform and equipment. It is the coach's role to know the rules, allowances, and restrictions. It is the coach's role, right? Shifting it onto them and not 
necessarily just onto us to be the fashion police. It is the official's role to monitor the players and the uniform. And this obviously begins in pregame warmups. We want to take care of as much as we can. Warm-up shirts come off. There's new evidence that we have to explore. Substitutes are coming into the game. We need to evaluate prior to their uh, entry into the game whether they are legal, etc. We do that already, okay? Let's understand, understand that there are no new rules regarding uniforms and equipment. If that isn't possible, then proper penalties must be levied, whether it be against the player or the coach, dependent upon the rule. If it's an illegal uniform, and a uniform is clearly defined by rule, if it's illegal, that's a direct technical foul on the head coach. There is no penalty on anybody for illegal equipment. If a player is illegally equipped with miscolored arm sleeve, uh, miscolored headband, improper t-shirt, wearing jewelry, etc., that player shall be directed to leave the game, repair their situation, and then they are el eligible to play. There is no penalty by rule that we can enforce on those players or that coach for equipment violations. Let's be clear about that 100%. All right, let's take a look at new rules for 2018. Hey, congratulations. There are no new rules for 2018. It's important to keep that in mind. What do we have? Well, there's new ball regulations for 2019. Deeply pebbled channels, etc., that take effect next year. So, are there any new regulations on the ball for this year? No. No new rules regarding the ball for this year, 2018. There's a clarification about an erroneous backcourt rules interpretation from 2007. We get documentation. There's rules book language about backcourt plays, right? Understand that it is specifically addressing one erroneous rules interpretation from 2007. There are no new rules rules regarding backcourt violations. Everything's the same, okay? Don't get caught up and rethink and your understanding of backcourt. We'll cover backcourt plays. We'll cover this play specifically so we understand what this verbiage is all about. But there are no new rules regarding backcourt violations. One more clarification about screeners needing to be, in order to be legal, must be establish their screen on the court. If they have a foot on the line, out of bounds, they are by rule not in a legal screening position. Just a simple clarification. No big deal. There's no new rules regarding screening. Okay, we have a point of emphasis this year for coaches. This point of emphasis is geared towards coaches. Understand that. Coaches have responsibility to know and enforce uniform equipment rules. They're no longer off the hook. Coach, are your players legally equipped? I hope so, right? No, they need to know, right? They've been given this task. They need to learn the rules. Now, this puts a lot of pressure on us to be extremely consistent about what the rules are, okay? So we're gonna take a brief section just to review. All right, here's our review. This is the way I describe it. Understand different sets, classifications of equipment. Okay, undershirt. A player is wearing an undershirt. Undershirt is an extension of the jersey. Okay, I'm wearing a red jersey. I must wear a red undershirt. That's the color restriction. Red undershirt, red jersey. I'm wearing a white jersey, must be white. Black jersey, must be black. Simple. Predominant color of the jersey, t-shirt, same. Undershirt, rather, is by itself. Now, we have a package of stuff, okay? We have other equipment. We have headbands, wristbands, sleeves on the arm, sleeves on the leg, tights extending below the short, okay? 
sleeves on arms and legs, wristbands, headbands, they're all in a package. Okay? National Federation of High School all must be the same color. Okay? All must be in that package. Everything in that package must be the same color. Those colors are always black, white, or beige is legal, plus the predominant color of the jersey. All right? Very straightforward. We need to be consistent about this. Headband, wristband, sleeves, sleeves on the leg, tights. Okay? That's all part of the package. All has to be the same color for both the player and all the team members who participate in the game. Okay? Everybody's got to be the same. In addition, we have braces. Okay? I'm wearing a knee brace, a knee support brace. If it's a brace, by rule, there's no color restriction. It's not part of the package. Okay? Simple. Braces, by rule, not part of the package, no color restriction. What's left? Headgear. Okay? I'm wearing one of those soft padded things on my head. I'm wearing some sort of protective thing. I'm wearing a religious headgear. Okay? Cultural headgear. A turban, a head wrap of some sort. These are not part of the package. They do not have color restriction. Depending on your local regulatory body, they have been approved, not approved, etc. Okay, but they are not part of the package. What's in the package? Let's review. Headband, wristband, arm sleeve, leg sleeve, tights. All part of the package. Same color for each player, same color for each team member who participates. Simple. We need to be consistent on that. All right, that's all for that. The takeaway again for proper uniform and apparel. This is now the coach's responsibility. They need to embrace that role. The committee's left to conclude that the existing rule code adequately addresses the requirements. There are no rules changes, but must be understood by coaches and players and properly applied by contest officials. Now that we're shifting the responsibility for understanding onto the coach, we need to, as in our role, help those coaches understand the rules and restrictions by first of all being accurate, but also by being very consistent. This crew comes in, next night there's another crew, next night there's another crew, and they were all consistent in their interpretation of the rules about uniform and equipment. All right. Points of emphasis for officials, 2018. Traveling is a point of emphasis. Rough play during loose ball, understanding loose ball scenarios, enforcing penalties for illegal contact. Guarding principles and verticality. This is an essential part of what we do as basketball officials. We have to understand guarding principles and verticality. That's step one in the whole process. NFHS says, let's review, let's get better. All right. And finally, professionalism, the language that we use, the way that we communicate with all the stakeholders in the game. Point of emphasis, traveling. The problem is there are too many inaccurate rulings. More emphasis is needed in finding the pivot foot and officials need to know, understand fully the rules and restrictions about traveling. Here's the heart of the matter right here. With the advent of popular moves, such as the Eurostep, officials at times appear to call infractions that are not violations because they look funny. But at the same time, we miss violations that should be called. They, the player did travel, and we're not calling traveling. Consistency of accuracy is the problem. Traveling is called when it's legal. Traveling is not called when it's illegal. Quick review. After coming to a stop and establishing a pivot foot, a pivot foot may be lifted, but not returned to the floor before the ball is released on a pass or try for goal. If a the player jumps, neither foot may be returned to the floor before the ball is released on a pass or try for goal. Here's a quick tidbit. Knowing the rules would better allow officials to administer the rules related to traveling. That is a true statement. Point of emphasis, guarding and verticality. Again, understanding what legal guarding position 
is absolutely essential and understanding the principle of verticality. Again, this is the bread and butter of what we do as basketball officials is officiate whether a player is legal when they guard or not. Point of emphasis, rough play on loose balls. Again, concussions are a focus for NFHS. They want to reduce injuries in the game of basketball. They want to reduce injuries by reducing rough play that leads to injuries. Addressing rough play involves properly penalizing illegal contact in loose ball situations. That's our point of emphasis. The committee feels that with these reminders, excessive physical contact while recovering a loose ball can be properly administered and prevent situations from escalating into more egregious acts. Our takeaway here, the rules about recovery of the ball require constant review to ensure that acts are not deemed as violations that are in fact legal, such as sliding with the ball. We're concentrating on possession of the ball, players being hindered or obstructed from a legal path to the ball, if a loose ball is possessed by opponents, blow the whistle immediately, right? We have a held ball situation on the floor. Blow the whistle immediately. End the play. If a player is impeded by an opponent, rule a foul immediately. Point of emphasis, professionalism. What we want to do is look at, examine individually, all of our interaction with game stakeholders. We arrive at a venue, the athletic director lets us into the coach's room or our changing area. Our interactions with that person, professionalism at all times. Game administration, we come out onto the floor, we identify our game administrator. We're gonna ask them where they'll be during the game so that we can come to them with any issues with the crowd. We don't wanna interact directly with the crowd or any issues around the court that can be handled by the game administrator. That's their rule. Okay, we'll introduce ourselves to them. We'll alert our partners to who they are, where they'll be, etc. But our interactions with them are professional. Our table personnel are part of our crew. We need to be professional with them. There can be frustrations related to their competence sometimes, but again, we remain professional. We elevate the game. And obviously with coaches, we just want to take the high road and be professional. We're professional with our language. And also we're going to have an emphasis, we're going to examine this year, having an emphasis on rules book language with our communications. So that again, we can achieve a level of consistency as a group of officials, how we present information to the stakeholders in the game. We want to have a rules book emphasis on our language. Scoring the goal as opposed to counting the basket, end line instead of baseline, division line instead of midcourt line, etc. Just basics. Our rules clarification for this year about backcourt involves, involves one single play that was improperly interpreted by the committee in 2007 as being a violation. We're going to look at that play. This play is now by rule legal. So the NFHS said, you know what? We had this interpretation. It was wrong. We're going to fix it by including an exception into the rule, but recognize that the rules have not changed. Here's our play. This is a legal play. In 2007, NFHS said this play is illegal and this is a backcourt violation on red. Let's look at the play. All right. When we look at backcourt plays, Let's go through our process, our checklist. We have team control by red. They are holding or dribbling the ball in the backcourt. The ball is passed and contacted by a player with front court status, white. This means the ball now has front court status by rule. Again, these are the basics. The red player with backcourt status, jumps and catches the ball in the air, now giving it backcourt status. In 2007, NFHS had an interpretation 
this play is now illegal. We're going to rule that this player was both the last to touch in the front court and the first to touch in the back court simultaneously by catching the ball. It was uh, convoluted logic and has been corrected. Okay, this play is now legal. A critical component to understand is even though there's language being expressed by NFHS about backcourt rules and restrictions, this is the only play that is being addressed. This one play. This play is legal. There are no rules changes regarding backcourt violations. Don't get hung up in thinking that there are. Ball is loose, black player lands on top of the white player. That's a play we need to address, okay? Players are allowed to equally pursue the ball, but if they're with their body, they are playing the other player and have rough play and sue, that needs to be addressed. That play is pretty subtle. This one's more obvious. So, loose ball, team control white. The white player plays the red player, going after the red player with illegal contact. That's what needs to be addressed. Okay. So, in this situation, we have white with team control. This would be a team control foul on white. Verticality plays. All right. White 24 has a spot on the floor, jumps straight up, is actually yielding just a little bit. Contact occurs. This is a legal play. Now, White turned her body, allowed by rule. This is a legal play. The principle of verticality applies legal. White defending, watch the feet. Has a spot on the floor, 34 goes up, legal. White is strong, red runs into a brick wall, watch the feet, that's his spot, legal. Straight up, yielding, the displacement is ruled as incidental, Legal. All right. Now we have a foul. All right. We've had three legal plays. Now we have a foul. What's the difference? Note the defensive player goes from a single spot on the floor from A to B, causing contact. Moving towards the player, illegal contact, foul. All right, we've all seen this play. Right, we got the illegal chuck. And then reflexively, the hands up. Coach, I was legal. I was legal. Block charge plays, bread and butter. So when we look at block charge plays or guarding plays, Obviously, the first thing we need to do is establish whether a player had legal guarding position. Legal guarding position is clearly defined by rule as a player with two feet on the floor, torso facing their opponent. Okay, so we're going to look at that. They've obtained legal guarding position. They can maintain legal guarding position by moving laterally obliquely, or back, legal. Once a player is airborne, their defensive position must be established prior to the player going airborne. Right? Our basic framework for legal guarding position. Step number one in the process. Is the player legal? Does he have two feet on the floor, 
torso facing the opponent. Yes, this player has legal guarding position, but his feet are wide. Are feet part of the definition of legal guarding position? No. Torso contact. On this play, a block is ruled. Upon reflection, looks like a charge. All right. Before we see this play, let's just remember NFHS wants to reduce injuries, reduce concussions, reduce rough play. Okay. Let's see if this play needs a whistle. Yes, it needs a whistle. We're looking at the defender on this passing crash. Before the player goes airborne, does he establish a legal position? Does he have two feet on the floor facing the opponent prior to the player going airborne? Yes. Torso contact should be a charge. Needs a whistle in any event. Note. State championship, 18 seconds into the first period. Excellent. Is the player legal? Two feet on the floor, facing his opponent. Yes. What is he allowed to do on a dribbler? He can, his, his objective is to move his torso into the path of the player. That's his objective. That's the objective of guarding, moving your torso. Does he legally move his torso, watch his feet, laterally, obliquely, or back? That's our judgment on a play like this. Secondary defender block charge play. So what we want to do is evaluate, is she legal? Does she have two feet on the floor facing her opponent? Is she there prior to the player going airborne? Two feet on the floor facing her opponent, player yet to go airborne, yes. Torso contact, yes. Charge, yes. Secondary defender play. Two feet on the floor facing his opponent. Arch. Two feet on the floor facing her opponent prior to airborne. Close. All signs point to call incorrect. Eh, close. But that's, that's simply the formula we're looking for. Is the player legal? Is there torso contact? If the player is not there legally, we have a block. If the player is there legally and we have torso contact, we have a charge. That's our process for evaluation. All right, we're going to look at many different traveling plays here. Again, point of emphasis is inaccuracy is a problem. Legal plays are being called illegal. Illegal plays are not having a whistle. Okay. When we look at these traveling plays, first thing we're going to do always is establish the pivot foot. Right? That's our step one in our process as officials for evaluating legality. In this case, left foot, pivot foot, clear, pretty obvious. That's a legal move. That's what we want in our game. Left foot, pivot. Legal. All right, what do we have here? Player dribbles, picks up the ball. Her left foot is her pivot foot, correct? We can agree on that. 
This ball is in the lead's primary. The lead is officiating this primary matchup. Player lifts their left foot, legal, and returns it to the floor, illegal. Violation ruled. Call correct. Let's look at another play. It's going to look pretty similar. Left foot pivot. Lifts the left foot. Releases the ball. This is a play that, quote unquote, looks funny. But what we need to do is, is understand the rule on the play and not just react to look funny. We want to choose to rule accurately. All right, here's a sequence of plays. This player alights off of his left foot, lands simultaneously with two feet. This is a legal play. That's going to be the basis for the next couple of plays. Jumps off one, lands on two simultaneously. That's legal. Jumps off one, lands on two, but what's different? Jumps off the left foot, legal. Lands simultaneously with two, legal. Everything's good, but then lifts a foot and puts it back down, illegal. Here we are. Right foot pivot jumps off one, lands with two simultaneously, a legal play. Jumps to shoot, is fouled, but a erroneous traveling violation is ruled. All right, play seven is a Euro step play. Holding the ball, left foot pivot, Jumps off the right, legal play. All right, a more skilled example. Left foot, right foot, legal. Important to remember with Eurostep plays why our brain potentially gets tricked. The, the player changes speed dramatically, right? And that's the point of the move. And when it seems like they really slow down and our brain says, oh, wait a minute, something funny has happened. Okay. We have to fight through that and just judge the footwork on its merits. Whoa, that's got to be a travel. Let's remember in, in loose ball plays, player can slide with the ball. They can slide any length. It's not defined by rule. Once they have stopped sliding, there are restrictions. They can sit up, but they cannot roll over, nor may they attempt to stand. So they can sit up, pass, shoot, dribble, call timeout. All those things are available to them. Similar play. All right. We're a little more deceptive on this play as the player has twisted her body. But that's a legal play. She has not rolled over. She basically just reached behind her, collected the ball, and brought it in front of her. Simple. Can't jump, lift your pivot foot, and then initiate a dribble. One of the basics. Okay, a player holding the ball is not allowed to stand or attempt to get up. This player does. Official doesn't react. One of the other important parts of the point of emphasis is recognizing how our position affects our ability to make proper rulings. In this case, the official is too close to the play. 
I call it looking in the well. When you're looking down towards your feet, it's difficult to have accurate rulings. At least it was for this guy on this play. All right, a look funny play. Let's establish the pivot foot. Jumps off one. All right, a look funny play. Let's establish the pivot foot. Holding the ball, left foot pivot, right foot slides. Legal. Puts a hand down. Legal. We can put our, we can, that's the one thing we can put on the floor legally holding the ball. Legal play. Similar. Right foot pivot. Elbow touches the floor. Illegal. Again, close proximity by the official may be a factor in terms of judging the play. From here, it's obvious. Post play. Let's look for pivot. Looks like we have a right foot pivot. Legal. Little hop. Holds the ball. Hand under the ball. Returns the pivot foot to the floor. That's traveling before the foul. All right, that's, let's do a quick review. We're talking about new rules for 2018. The great news is there are no new rules for 2018. There's simply two clarifications, one about an erroneous backcourt call. There's no change in backcourt rules. Also, screeners must be on the court to be legal, a simple clarification. Coaches now have a point of emphasis that they are responsible for knowing the rules and regulations regarding uniforms and equipment. We're going to help them, but they need to embrace that role. For officials, we have four areas of concern. One is traveling. The second is illegal contact during loose ball situations, potential rough play being eliminated. Reviewing of guarding principles and verticality, absolutely an essential of what we do as basketball officials. And we're also looking to just look at our level of professionalism and upgrade in er any area that we can in terms of our communication with stakeholders school administrators, athletic directors, site administrators, coaches, table personnel, partners, having a more professional level of language, the way that the way, what we use as well. We just want to improve. All right, that's going to wrap it. The 2018 look at points of emphasis for NFHS basketball in 2018. Looking at the points of emphasis, understanding them, incorporating them into our game as basketball officials will make us better. That's what we're all about here at A Better Official. I'll put a link right here on our website of a copy of the points of emphasis that you can review for yourself. Remember, thanks Mike for the cup of coffee. If you want to buy us a cup of coffee as well, there's a link on that page. You can check it out there. Thanks so much. Like, subscribe, share. If the video is of value to you and you think it could be of value to others. Good luck to all officials as we prepare for the upcoming season. I hope it's your best season ever. Keep coming back for our content. Hopefully it can make you a better official and we can get better together. All right. Take care.